Sounds great. Just wave your hand when you're ready. All right. Thank you all for coming this afternoon. Thank you for letting me have this opportunity uh, to teach for a few minutes and to spend this time uh, with you. My name is Gary Dodd, and I am a member of the uh, Concord Road Church of Christ here in town, and uh, have the privilege of introducing myself in a new way this afternoon. Uh, next Monday, I get to start working with Sunset International Bible Institute and we'll be a representative on the east side of Mississippi uh, for them and uh, Lord willing, traveling and speaking to different churches and trying to be involved in different mission efforts with which they're involved and God has opened that door and I'm just very grateful uh, to be able to say that uh, this afternoon. And so uh, Tom and uh, Debbie Cote are here and back here and they're uh, here as they recruit people for the uh, Bible Training uh, Institute in Lubbock, which is a residential program, and then spread the word for other people. And they're here working the booth, and, and so I'm happy to introduce them to you and invite you to go by and learn more about uh, Sunset if you have the opportunity. They're near the coffee pots, and so they've got a prime location, a couple tables in there if you'd like to see them. Well, I was hoping Alan Stevens might be here. Alan and I went to Ohio Valley College together. 1976, 1978, and uh, I remember Alan uh, having one of his first dates uh, on campus, and he was so excited about it, and uh, it was a local girl that he met, and he wanted to uh, take her out, and he came to me, and he said, I've, I've never, you know, just dated a lot, and he said, what do I do, and I told him, you know, well, you have to just ask, not be afraid to, to ask, worst thing can happen, she can say no. Uh, and then I said, she says, yes, you know, when you take her out, I said, it's a good thing if you pay, uh, you can, you know, uh, help her get seated at the table. And, you know, if you go to a movie, uh, you lead her in. When the movie's over, you step back and let her lead you out. And went through all that. And, and uh, they finally came where he picked her up and he took her out and Evening had gone well, and they'd had a good time, and got to the house, and he just went into a panic mode internally because he had forgotten how to ask how to end the date. And so he was just kind of rocking back and forth, talking, his voice getting a little bit higher, and, and he finally uh, just said, well, I had a real nice time, and he bent over and kissed her on the forehead, and she looked at him and said, lower, and he said, I had a real nice time. Uh, and so... I wanted you to know that uh, about Alan, but uh, I look at Alan and I think he's so far exceeded me in the way that uh, he shares his love for the Lord with so many people and encourages every good work, and he's been just a, Lord has used him uh, to be a driving force in this area to put this uh, together, and he's coordinated and worked so hard, and and it's just wonderful to see the amount of people that have been here uh, to uh, enjoy and benefit uh, from the fellowship and from the classes. And so I'm very grateful uh, for what Alan has done. But we're going to have an opportunity this afternoon to talk for a few minutes about a question that I've put up here, so what about eternity? It's not like so what about eternity, like it doesn't matter, but it's the question, so what about eternity? And the reason I phrased it that way is one of my teachers years ago told me that when I preached, I didn't need to just tell people what the text says, but I need to tell them the so what of what the text is emphasizing so that people could apply it to their lives. And so my training uh, background is a little mixed. I have preached for a number of years. Uh, for the last uh, 12 or so years, I've worked primarily about here's Alan. I just told him about your first date, brother. And uh, yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. You can defend yourself when it's over. I understand. Yes, sir. And so um, he told me, you know, you need to tell him so what. You need to apply the text. You need to make sure people understand why the text says what it says, but also how to apply it uh, to people's lives. And so we want to talk about eternity from the standpoint of what does that mean uh, to you and me. And so 
I don't know if you've ever thought about this or not, but have you ever thought about uh, the question, was Jesus ever discontented? Sounds like an odd question to ask, but I'll tell you what uh, made me uh, think about it. Uh, the New Testament, of course, talked about being content. Uh, Paul said, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. So I'm raising the question, was Jesus ever discontented? Paul said he followed Christ. He was imitating Christ. And he writes to the Philippian church, and he says, not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Paul then writes to Timothy, and he says, gives us a little mathematical uh, equation, and he says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. And then, two verses later, in 1 Timothy, he says, but if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. So if he's a follower of Christ, and he's saying that he has learned in life to be content, was Jesus ever discontented? And so those are very specific verses that you have to look to in context to understand what Paul's talking about. I received some unsolicited advice from one of my supervising physicians uh, a few weeks ago. He had someone not show up for an appointment that morning, and he said, I put him on your schedule for this afternoon, and I worked in opioid recovery, licensed as a nurse practitioner, and he said, I want you to know about this patient that's coming in to see you. And he said, we're going to start here. But then he came back with a second message. He said, I want to comment a little bit further about what I told you. He said, I told you where I was content to start. But he said, I want you to know I will not be content to lead this patient where they are. And after I heard him say that, I wrote him back and I said, I will quote you on this. Because when you think about discontentment in the life of our Lord through that lens, yes, I think I can answer the question that Jesus was discontent at times. And so I'll raise the question with you this afternoon. Is it possible to have what we might call a holy discontent? And I didn't even know there was a book out there with that title until I put in the word discontent into a search engine and found that someone that preaches at a large community church in another state has published a book called Holy Discontent. And so I wish I'd have come up with it first. But John 3, verses 1 and 2, Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night. He's a leader, a man of the Pharisees. And he's a ruler of the Jews. And he comes, he asks Jesus, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher. Come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus had to be grateful that someone from that sect had that impression in their heart. But was Jesus content to leave him there? No. Jesus said, I'll tell you what. I'm glad that you are recognizing who I am. But he says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So in one sense, you could say he was content with where he found this man, but he was not going to be content to leave him where he was. You remember this story, a rich young ruler in Luke chapter 18 comes to Jesus and he asks him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And in his response to him, he says, well, you know the commandments. Don't commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And the religious ruler said, you know, I've done that, you know, from my youth up. And Jesus would have appreciated, you know, what he had done in that regard, obeying uh, the commandments. But he wasn't content to leave him there because he knew something else about him. And so he says, look, one thing you still lack, though, you need to go and sell all that you have and distribute it to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven and then come follow me. So Jesus at times was discontent with people. And he said, but I'm, I'm going to bring you forward. I'm not going to leave you where you are. I'm content with what I first learned about you. But, you know, lady caught in adultery. Jesus knew that she had been entrapped by the religious leaders. were using her as a pawn. And, you know, so he addressed that. They leave, they don't pick up stones and stone her to death. 
But he doesn't leave it there. He looks at her and he says, go and sin no more. Uh, Brett Farr was teaching this morning. And he was talking about the disciples when they come back, came back from the limited commission. And they came back from that and they were so excited about how God was working through them. And you know, Jesus had to be excited to hear that too. But he also knew the danger that that excitement could morph into a spiritual arrogance. And so he tells me, he says, look, it's one thing to be excited about how God's working through you, but it's another, he said, but what's really important is your names are written in heaven. And so there were times that Jesus was discontent. And he wanted to do, he wanted to bring the people forward. He didn't want them to stay where they were. And so having tried to answer that briefly, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you that it addresses so many areas in our lives. We thank you, Father, for what we can learn if we look closely and listen intently and, and we study and, and just see what's revealed to us about who you are. This afternoon we pray, Father, that we'll see that more clearly and that you'll motivate us uh, to follow you as we think about the meaning of eternity in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So there are positive and negative events in all of our lives that trigger uh, spiritual assessment. Uh, I have a letter that I received. I was copied on this from a couple who've been married over 60 years. In their families, respectively, they're the last child living on either side of their family. One had lost eight brothers and sisters. I don't know how many siblings uh, the gentleman had. And they wanted to write this letter to their nieces and nephews. And so they said, dear nieces and nephews, near and far. And they said, we're sitting here thinking, reflecting, praying for each one of you. We're thankful for each one of you and who each of you are, but thank each of you are special in your own unique way. And as we reflect, we can't help but think of your losses, your goals, uh, your accomplishments, your struggles, your hurts, your gifts, your talents. Some of these things about you we know very well, and some of these things we really only wonder. And we pray for you. There's not one thing you could do that would stop us from wait, wanting the best for you. We love to see you, to hear from you, to catch up, read posts, share pictures, and to share life's moments with you, the good and the bad. And we are thankful God gave each of you to us. But if there's only one thing that you could learn from us, we hope it would be this. Nobody, yes, nobody, has or ever will love you like Jesus. Not your parents, your best friend, your guy or girlfriend, or even your spouse. Your children that adore you, admire you, and look up to you could never love you like Him. His love is indescribable, unmeasurable, and undeniable. And it truly is the greatest love of all. Life can fail you. Friends will hurt you. Loss can consume and pain can be way too real. But you're never alone. He is greater than all of life's messes. And he will direct you always as you seek him. I know too well through my own mistakes and struggles that he is the only answer to life's problems. And he's the only one to fill an empty void that may be present. Trust him. And then they go ahead and they've written a prayer that they prayed for each of their nieces and nephews. And I am so thankful that I'm part of that family. Powerful, powerful message. But you know the truth is they're on up there in years. Uh, they have lived long lives. And one of their daughters was telling me, or maybe it was my little sister was telling me, that Uncle Lowell is a cuddler. And they still fall asleep in each other's arms at night. And it's just wonderful. Uncle Lowell has the thickest hair of anybody I know. And she brushes his hair every day. Uh, it's just amazing to watch them. Uh, but what happens, we have 
uh, intersections in life with things that at one sense are ex expected, some are positive, some are negative. This is my oldest grandson sitting back here by my wife. and uh, What a joy when he was born. Uh, we were up in Hinton, West Virginia a couple of August ago. Uh, and went up on the side of a mountain and visited uh, the grave where my maternal grandparents are buried. But prior to that, we'd gone to the house where they lived and the people that are living there now just said, walk to anywhere on the farm you want to walk. Twenty years ago, in July, just uh, we finished a bicycle ride as a family through all 48 lower contiguous states. We're gone for eight and a half months, rode about 9,500 miles, and so we celebrated that uh, 20th anniversary. But you know, when you have anniversaries, when you have losses, when you have great things happen like your grandchildren being born, it's just wonderful uh, to have those experiences. It's hard to go through losses, but God is always with you, and it triggers questions, so you have to make spiritual assessments. So this afternoon, I want to ask you to make a spiritual assessment in your own heart. Uh, we had bracelets people were wearing years ago, and probably some people still wearing them. What would Jesus do? But what we want to talk about for the next few moments is what Jesus did. John chapter 4 tells a very familiar story, and the text is uh, that text where Jesus meets a Samaritan woman uh, at a well. And if you re run through, and we don't have time to go verse by verse uh, through John chapter 4 this afternoon, but if you run through it, there are some very practical so what answers about how we should live with respect to eternity. Uh, hot, arid day. Uh, Pharisees are beginning to attack uh, Jesus publicly. And uh, complaining and accusing him of making and baptizing uh, more disciples than John the baptizer. And so Jesus decides he's going to go in another direction for a while, and he leaves Judea, and he departs uh, again to go to Galilee. And as he's walking, it has to be really hot. By the time they get to the place known as where Jacob's well was there in the area of Samaria. A lot of Jews would walk around Samaria. But the text in John 4 says he had to go through Samaria. He didn't have to because it was required to go. He didn't have to because it was the only road and way to get uh, to Galilee. There was something inside of him driving him to go to Samaria. And when the sixth hour of the day comes, around noon, they, they make it to Jacob's well. And it says, Jesus sat down. Maybe it's just really hot, fatigued, and tired, hot, arid day, midday. You know the type of weather we've been having here. Uh, and so he sits down. His disciples leave, and they go into the city uh, nearby town to buy some food. But Jesus is sitting there, and you can imagine him sitting down, and maybe the surface of and first getting up a little bit and then maybe finding a comfortable place to sit, and getting used to the, the heat. And he looks up, and there's a woman carrying a, a container that is approaching, approaching the well. And as he, she gets closer, he knows that this is a woman from Samaria. And she, he looks at her and he says, would you give me a drink? And she looks at him and says, you're a Jew. Why would you ask me, a woman of Samaria? And then parenthetically, the Apostle John writes, you know, that the Jews uh, just didn't have that type of interaction with Samaritans. And of all things, he's talking to a Samaritan woman. And Jesus answered her. He said, well, if you knew the gift of God and what, who it is that's saying this to you, give me a drink you would have asked him, and he would have uh, given you the well. Uh, uh, you know, he would have given you a very special type of water, living water. And the woman said to him, uh, you don't have anything to, to pull water out with. How are you going to get water from inside this well? And she rehearses the history of Jacob and 
his ancestors and what they did and his descendants. And he said he gave us the well and drank from it himself and to his sons and his livestock. And then Jesus says to her, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water uh, that I give, the spring of water that I can expose them to, will never be thirsty again because it comes from a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman responds to him and says, Sir, then give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. I was in Nicaragua at the Nicaragua, or not Nicaragua, but Nigeria, the Nigerian Christian Hospital. And a lady was brought in, and she was hospitalized. She's in a hospital bed, and she had a sore on the side of her knee, one of her legs. And the doctors knew that she had a serious infection in her leg. And they told her, they said to preserve her life, that they were going to have to do something surgically to that. And she didn't want them messing with her leg. The role she had in the village was she walked to the water every day, grew the water, and brought it back to her village. That was her job. That's what gave her identity. That's who she was. And each day, the inspect infection was spreading. The fever was increasing. The redness in her leg was creeping up. Uh, to where it wasn't going to be too long until it was uh, near uh, the lower part of her abdomen. And so she finally consented that she would have surgery, and by then they were going to have to amputate her leg. And they asked me to help them position her on the table so that she could receive her anesthesia. And when I rolled her over on the table, and this is just a gross story, but that, that area sore, sore on her leg, that wound just popped open. And you would have thought that... Uh, she was a waterfall with all this purulent fluid just flowing out of her leg and splashing on the floor below. This woman knew that she had an important job. And the later in the story, what you're going to hear is that uh, when she really took to heart what Jesus was saying to her, uh, she ran back to the village and left her container at the well. She knew that she had heard him say, you know, I have life-giving water that will quench your spiritual thirst. And so you can learn some very practical lessons. Old Chinese proverbial saying that you've heard quoted many times, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. And in a world where it just seems like there's deeper and deeper matters that divide us from other people. Jesus was fascinated with building bridges, not driving wedges between people, but building bridges between people. And so one of the first things you learn from this story is that uh, Jesus, you often hear people talk about meeting people where they are, and he was content to do that. He found her life where it was, he related to her in life, where she was. But then he also said, I'm going to walk a little further with you. He interacted with her. And you know, when you think about that, we have the opportunity to do that every day, don't we? To look someone in the eye that cashes us out as a cashier in a store, to look our neighbors in the eye, to talk to them. You know, the call is to walk with people as you go. You know, take the gospel to them. We have an opportunity to do that and to walk with them if we choose to interact with them. It's easy to say, not tonight, I'm tired, I'm going in, the blinds are drawn in the front of the house, I'm going to close the garage door, I'm not going to mess with anybody, get on an airplane. And to think, you know, I'm really tired, I just, I've got to do some reading for work or whatever it is I need to do, or I just want to, you know, spend a little time receiving some entertainment and to try purposefully not to make eye contact with people. I was naive enough when I was 50 years old and I was going into medical practice that I was going to make some of those doctors look people in the eye and talk to folks, you know. They can get on an elevator and it's just like you're not even there, you know. But I engaged people and I talked to them and I spoke to them. 
And at one point, one of the nurses that was trained me said, would you just shut up, you know? And uh, said, you don't even know these people. And you're saying, hi, how are you doing? He said, why are you asking them how are you doing? And just the way I was raised, but Jesus interacted with him. And why did he do it? Because he was not just concerned about physically homeless, he was concerned about those who were spiritually homeless. And he wanted to help them find their home with God. And so this is one of my favorite verses in the New Testament, especially in the Gospels, where Jesus says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him. And then he says, and we will come and make our home with him. Where does Jesus live? He says, if we love him, we obey him, he's going to make his home right here in our hearts. Jesus interacted, but he not only interacted, he did it with intentionality. Samaritan woman, he knew, realized who it was. But when it says he had to go through Samaria, it's like John is setting that up for us. And he's going to engage with this Samaritan woman. He didn't care what the normal protocols of the day were, or what the social ethic was. He was going to engage her, and he was going to empathize with her, which he does as you listen to the conversation. And he's going to encourage her spiritually. And so what we learn from that is, uh, we're called to join with Jesus Christ in opening hearts to the will of God. And we need to think about that and do it intentionally. And he was great at doing that. First John 2 and verse 17 says, The world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. And so he wanted to open her heart to the will of God. And he said, you can live forever if you just drink of the water that I offer you. And then Jesus is going to introduce her to what she really needs to know. He's going to introduce her to a loving father. He's going to introduce her to himself. And it's surprising so early in the Gospels that Jesus is telling a woman from Samaria that he's the Messiah. You know, people were looking for him. You know, people that were great students of the Old Testament, people wanted to know, and he chooses to reveal himself to this woman from Samaria by a well. But he's patient as he does it. Because he's giving her time as he in incrementally interacts with her intentionally uh, to express that she believes, which she does. And then he doesn't just see a prospect for a Bible study, but he sees a person. And I love this. I was in and out of a house that people with very chronic illness, a couple, and I mean as soon as they would open the door and say, come in, Gary, just this odor of urine would just smack me in the face. And I got to the point, and I'm embarrassed to tell you this, I got to the point to where I wanted to ask them the questions I needed to ask to do my assessment and plan. And I just wanted to get in and get out. And one day I stopped a couple of blocks from their house and I prayed. And I said, Lord, help me to see this couple as people. And I got to the door and it was Final Four time. You know, it was the NCAA tournament. And the guy was sitting in his wheelchair right in front of the big screen TV. And so instead of just popping him questions about where they were medically, I looked at the gentleman and I said, I said, you like basketball? And he said, yeah. He said, I used to referee games up in southern Kentucky. I said, you did? He said, yeah. I said, well, my brother was head basketball coach at Lindsey Wilson College for a number of years. He says, what's your last name again? I told him and he said, he said, I think I called some of your brother's games. And we got to talking, and before I knew it, 45 minutes had passed. I hadn't asked a single medical question. But the Lord answered my prayer, and I was seeing people, not patients. And I was dealing with it, who they were internally. And not just seeing a disease process. 
Jesus saw her as a person. And he didn't think of her just as a prospect of someone that needed a Bible study. But he thought about her future prospects. And he wanted her to know that uh, he had an answer for her. And so he knew what his ultimate agenda was. That all people would be saved. And you're familiar with this verse from 2 Peter 3.9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise. Or as some count slowness. But is patient toward you not wishing that any should perish. But that all should reach repentance. When people talk about the will of God and what's the will of God. The will of God is Jesus wants, God wants everybody to come to repentance. And so he dealt with her and tried to discern what her interests were. And he had to make, uh, he had to discern whether she was saying, I'm not interested in what you're saying. Or if you're telling me enough that I, I just am really starting to feel uncomfortable. And Jesus interacted with her in such a way that he was able to get to the point uh, that he could address her deepest need. He stayed focused on her as a person. And so Jesus was able to do what we need someone to do, and ha they've done that probably in our lives already, uh, to remember that there was a time in our lives when we were separated from Christ. We didn't have hope. We didn't have God in our lives. But Jesus, uh, you know, he came and you who were once far off were brought near by his blood. And Jesus wanted this lady to know that he was going to give his blood for her. And then he reveals in this story the source of spiritual satisfaction, the water that satisfies, the water that will quench her thirst eternally. And so we're called to boldly share the genuine hope that people have and can find in Jesus Christ that can only be found in God who raised Jesus from the dead. And so Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty again. Or another way to translate this would be never be thirsty forever. And so we can learn a lot, but this is the phrase I want you to carry home with you. Life is not about time, but life is about eternity. And so I want to give you a few exhortations for an eternal perspective from Colossians. You know, if you look up the word identity, it's amazing. You type that into Google or some search engine. You know, there's all this stuff going on right now. How do you identify yourself, you know? And it just, you know, it just you can't believe there were that point where a Supreme Court nominee can't even say this is what a woman is and identify or define that. But there are other things that you'll find on there. What's your cultural identity? What's your parental identity? Uh, there's a whole series of stuff you can find in business literature about what's your leadership identity. Uh, when you think about your presence online, what is your digital identity? And all of these different things that are there, but what I really think is so critical crucial is that we identify who we are spiritually. And so we're all called to a drastic identity shift in our life through faith. What the Apostle Paul does in the letter to the Colossians is, he says, I want everybody to become complete in Jesus Christ, mature in Jesus Christ. And he takes up the theme of how they're to do that in Colossians chapter 3. I love the way Paul writes in the first part of his epistles. He tells you the indicative. This is what God has done for you. But then in the next part of the epistles, he says, here's the imperative. Here's how you respond to God. And he picks this up in Colossians 3. It's part of that uh, letter that says, here's how you respond to what God has done for you. And he says, you need to live earnestly in Jesus Christ. And there are two uh, imperatives that you find, but they flow out of this foundational assumption that if you have then been raised in Christ, if you've been baptized, if you've been uh, immersed, if you have been uh, brought into contact with the blood of Jesus Christ and you've been raised uh, to life by God through that act of faith in response to God's grace, the first imperative is to seek the things that are above. Second imperative is to not set your minds on things of this earth. And he 
repeats a second time to seek the things that are above. And then he goes on to say it's crucial that we hide our lives in Christ and we live with our new identity in Christ. And so out of that I learn it's a tragedy to only hear about eternity future and not hear about eternity now. John 10, Jesus says, I came to give life and to give it abundantly. He came to give us full lives now. And so when you read that text in Colossians 3, 1 through 4 closely, it says you have this identity in Christ now, and it then uses this little word, it says, and also it applies to your eternity. So we need to know about eternity now and how we should live as eternal uh, beings in relationship with God now. And so abundant life really is about eternity and it's not just about time. So what I want you to ask yourself is how does eternity fit into my life? Am I conscious of it? I want to introduce you to Jack and Gloria Rankin. This is a couple that made a decision that they were going to share the gospel with as many people as they could while they were alive. And they didn't wait just until the end of life. And so they had this little business card made. And they would give it to people in New York City. People they met near New York City, living in one of the boroughs or out on Long Island. And it said, may we invite you to visit with us. I loved what I read that a preacher is doing. It said a large uh, community church. And so I don't see everything eye to eye with what he's doing, but I love this idea. He would tell people, this is who I am. This is my name. If you come to worship with us, he said, when you come in, you just tell them, use my name. And he said, just tell them that I asked you to come sit with me. And I can't help but think, you know, what would that do in churches if the elders had business cards, their picture on it, and it just said, come sit with me, and had their name under their picture. If ministers had that, had their name under their picture. And then if what happened was they just told the ushers, this morning I'm going to be sitting on the upper left side, and this morning I'm going to be right in the middle and the back right side. You know, if someone comes in and they give you this card, you bring them and have them sit by me during worship. Jack and Gloria Jack got up in the pulpit and he announced to the church in Queens that he'd start an around-the-world fund for Jesus Christ. And he had. On Saturday, he'd opened a savings account at Chase Manhattan Bank in New York City with $1. So when he made that announcement, he was going to take his family around the world for Jesus. His account had a dollar in it. But about seven years later, they were on a plane as soon as school was over, and they went around the world for Jesus. When I married my wife, she had been to about 27, 28 different countries. And she was a ripe old age of 20. Doing part-time mission work for the Lord. And so, in light of eternity, what would be a good day for you? I've been taught in working with people near end of life to ask them, what would be a good day for you? I had a man tell me one time it would be a good day for him if he could get up in the morning, hit part of a bucket of golf balls, lived on a golf course, uh, or maybe play just a few holes, come home and rest. He's being treated for advanced cancer. But then he said, if I could get up, clean up, take my wife out for dinner, and if I could just swallow one piece of steak, that would be a good day for me. But if you think about having the opportunity to live that way now with eternity in view, What's a good day for you? Jack and Gloria went in New York City, paid cash for a trip to go to three different islands in the Pacific seven months later so they could do evangelistic work and help small churches. Jack went to the church building, just started calling people that hadn't been in church for a while or he hadn't seen or he knew needed spiritual encouragement. Spent the afternoon calling people. Met his wife to take her out on a date that night. 
in December of 1988 while waiting for a play to begin and Times Square had a massive heart attack and died. Now, if you could script how you were going to pass from this life and doing what was important, isn't that so wonderful? Where can we go and teach people about Jesus? Who can I call and try to impact today and encourage them to think about their relationship with God? I'm going to spend good time with my mate. He had no idea he was going to go home that night. But he lived that way because he had an eternal perspective. So how much are you thinking about living the eternal life here on this earth? You don't need to wait till you get to heaven to experience that abundant life, the eternal life. Oh, it's going to be greater when you get there. But you have abundant life now. Are we living it to the full? You don't want to wait until time's running out to talk to others about eternity. I don't think you do. You've got opportunities now. And so these are the words of a song uh, that I found in my reading. I tried to see if I could find it in a cappella, and I, I could not. But this is just so powerful. Peacemaker, fear taker, soul smoother or soother, storm smoother, light shiner, loss finder, cloud lifter, deliverer, heart toucher, truth lover. Who other could be fear taker and peacemaker to me? Mind clearer, sigh hearer. Hand holder, consoler, wound binder, tear dryer, strength giver, provider, heart healer, kind father. Who other could be my savior and peacemaker to me? Jack, come up here for a minute, buddy. And your grandmother's sitting right here, right? That's your mommy's mother. Mm hmm and her daddy lived in the same facility where your other great-grandparent lived, and that was your maternal. So there's your other grandmother, right? And her mother lived in the same facility. And you went over there to hear your great-grandfather sing in a choral presentation, right? And you looked up, and you saw your great-grandmother, Glow, as you called her, come in to hear that concert too, right? And you went over, and what did you do? Do you remember? You gave her a hug. And she hugged him, first grandchild. And she looked at him and said, I love you. I always have, and I always will. And nine days ago, uh, we buried her. Just... Took a sudden dive, a turn, 94 years old, four months old, 96 years old, four months old. And she passed away on July the 11th. We buried her on, I mean on July 16th, we buried her on July 20th. So what a hug to have and what thing to be said. And can't you hear when one of God's faithful children gets home? Him saying, I love you. I always have. And I always will. And that's what we want to help people to hear. Thank you, honey, for coming up. Uh, that's what we want to hear uh, when this world is over. I'm sure that Gloria would tell you. Lived almost 96 and a half years. I'm sure she would tell you life's not about time. From her vantage point of being with the Lord, she would say, Life is about eternity. And we're so time bound. We get so hung up on education and job and title and wealth. And will we be ready for eternity, you know, for retirement and that type of thing? But what's really important today is to realize you have a full and abundant life in Jesus Christ. And you're going to meet people if you choose to interact with them. With intentionality, you'll have an opportunity to introduce them to Jesus Christ. You can discern what their interests are, where they are, but if they're full of shame, you know that Jesus went outside of the city, went on the cross, bearing our shame, Hebrews says. 
you know that if they need peace, that he's the one that can give them peace. Life's about eternity. And we have an opportunity to share that with people we meet today. So, what about eternity? It gives us the opportunity, if we're wise, according to Proverbs chapter 11, to win souls for God. Let's end with prayer. Father, help us to understand the meaning of having a full and abundant life. And for what you hold for us, not only in eternity, but what you allow us to experience now. And help us to live this life, not like it's just about the time here, but help us to live this life knowing that life's about eternity. And help us to live purposefully. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. If you um, go by the uh, Sunset International Bible Institute, they've got a couple tables, like I said, near uh, the coffee. Uh, there is a, a framed uh, painting of uh, this artwork that I did for my wife, we, or for my, for my daughter. Um, uh, the, the Smokies at sunset in the background, and it's a phrase my little girl liked, and so did that uh, for her. Uh, but uh, there is a uh, print there that's on the table on some really nice uh, watercolor paper that was printed and has been treated archivally. Uh, and if you just write your name down on a, a card uh, that they may have there uh, later, write your name and address down, then uh, we'll pull a name out later and I will be happy uh, to mail you that copy of that print if you'd like to have it. So I invite you to go by and talk to them about that. You can see what it would look like in a frame if you want to leave your name and address there to where you could have that. Okay? Thank you for being here this afternoon. Thank you for